Well, good morning. I know Thursday is kind of a sleepy morning sometimes, but we did have bacon. So anybody excited about that? Yeah, yeah. bacon day is always a good day at Chahi. Um, I thought we'd start off with a little more uh, unquestionable Facebook research, right? Because Facebook research is, is always correct and it's always true. But I asked Facebook some time ago, well, I didn't ask Facebook, but I asked the, the people who uh, follow me or are friends with me, uh, a question about what are some things that you would consider to be opposites? What are some things that you consider to be opposites? So I, I got a list here. Hot and? Cold. Cold. Failure and? Success. Wow, you guys are great. Love and apathy. Day and night. Love and hate. Sweet and sour. Rich and? Hungry and full, loud and quiet, short and tall, east and west, wisdom and foolishness, men and women. <laughs> hey, just the research I got, all right, just the research. Lazy and diligent, lost and found, north and south poles, polar opposites, Eagles fans and Cowboys fans. It comes up again, go birds. Uh, do pray for me as I'm still uh, recovering from the Super Bowl and not sure that I ever will, but I'm going to try. But there are two things that are universally known to be opposites. In fact, they, there, is, there, there is nothing that could be further opposites than these two things. In fact, they are not only opposites, but they cannot even exist together. And they are light and darkness. Light and darkness. Darkness and light. Total opposites. And darkness and light cannot be present at the same time. When I came into this room a short time ago, there was no lights on. And I thought, uh oh, it's dark. It's dark in here. So I was able to get my little flashlight out of my phone, find my way up the stairs, and turn the lights on. But the moment that I hit that button to turn the lights on, what happened to the darkness in this room? gone, right? Because darkness and light cannot exist together, and light always dispels darkness every single time. You know, I, I am slightly competitive by nature, right? Slightly. All right, some of you know me better than others, and some of you have picked up that that was a, a bit of an understatement. I'm very competitive. I love competition. I love winning, right? It's one of the reasons I'm still struggling with the Eagles' loss. But, I, you know, I love the fact, like, if, if, if light and darkness were teams, like, I want to be team light. Does that make sense? Because light beats darkness every single time. And in the Bible, often light and darkness are used not just in the physical sense, but they're used to express spiritual realities. They're used to contrast what is good, what is holy, what is pure, what is true, and what is sinful and evil and not of God. In fact, not only are light and darkness used to show spiritual realities, but God himself declares that he is light. We are going to be uh, starting in 1 John this morning, a little letter in the back of your New Testament, 1 John chapter 1, is where we're going to be in just a few moments. And, and while, you're, while you're turning there and finding that passage, just a, a quick review as we've been talking about having a fresh start, a fresh start that I believe God wants to give you and give me. And listen, no matter where you came into Chehi, Right? You may have come into Chehi in a great place in your walk with Christ, and, and you are thriving and, and, and just really walking closely with Him. And if that's you, I, I'm glad to hear that, and I pray that your time here would only further and encourage your devotion to Christ and to relaunch the things that God has for you. Maybe you have come in here a little bit struggling, maybe in an area, maybe you just feel like I don't have that passion for Jesus that I used to or that, that devotion to Him, and God wants to give you a fresh start. Maybe there's an area of disobedience or sin that God's wanting to deal with. But whatever it is, or maybe you came in here not even a follower of Jesus. Whatever you came in, it's my prayer that you would encounter God for who He is. That you would see Jesus as the Son of God who loved you and gave Himself for you. Who wants you to know Him and to experience a relationship with Him. To experience His life in you and the purpose for which He created you. And that you would have a fresh start, a fresh launch. And so to do that, we've talked about obedience. Right? And obedience is really adopting God's will for our lives. 
It is our God's will that we would walk in obedience. We talked about wisdom, which is adopting God's view of the world around us and living by his wisdom. We talked about love, which is adopting God's heart for our relationship with him and with others. And today we're going to consider the subject of light. And specifically, what does it mean to live in the light? Now, as we come to 1 John, right, we have talked... Uh, we have addressed John, and we've encountered John already this week uh, in his gospel, and now in this letter that he writes to the church. And remember, John was privileged to be an eyewitness of Jesus. Right? He was one who was called out one day as he's working with his brother on the shore of the Sea of Galilee to be a follower, to be a disciple of, of Jesus. And so he gets this front row seat right, to the life of Jesus, to his ministry. He, he got to see the miracles happen with his own eyes. He got to hear Jesus speak. He got to watch him as he interacted with people. And whether it was showing compassion and grace and kindness to somebody stuck in the mire and muck of sin, or whether it was confronting or rebuking those who thought they were religious but were far from God. John had a, a first-hand account. He was an eyewitness. And now, this is much, much later in his life. Jesus has died. He's ascended into heaven. John is a much older man. He was likely the youngest disciple. He's also one that lives the longest. And he writes this letter, and as he opens it, we're, we're going to begin in verse 5, but just a quick summary. He opens it up by reminding his readers that, that he was an eyewitness to the life of Jesus. And that Jesus wasn't just somebody, but he had come to believe that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and he changed his life. And John wanted other people to know and experience what he had experienced. He wanted his readers to, to share in the very life of Jesus and to have fellowship with God and with one another. And fellowship means shared life, right? A lot of times I grew up in church, right? I grew up in the church world, and fellowship meant fellowship hall. And fellowship hall was for what? Food, all right? And so food became synonymous, or, or fellowship became synonymous with food. But, but, and sharing a meal is a great act of fellowship. It, it, is, a, it, is, a, it is an important act of fellowship. But, but our fellowship is so much more than a meal or a place in our church buildings. It's shared life. It's one of the things that makes Chehi so incredible because we get to come here and to share life together. We share music together. We share devotions together. We share Frisbee together. Right? We, we, we share meals. And it's this amazing fellowship. Now, if you're an introvert, I know after a while it can get a little what? You can get a little intense. You're like, I just need a little space. I need to get away from these people. But we were made for fellowship. And John wants his readers to experience this fellowship, this deep joy of knowing God and knowing others and to share in that life. And so as he writes his letter, he, he has that in mind. And let's begin 1 John chapter 1. Let's look at, at verse 5 just to begin. It says, now, this is the message. John says, this is the message that we heard. Right? And he says, I heard it personally. Right? This is in secondhand opinion. This isn't something I was taught. I heard it with my own ears. This is the message we heard from him. And declare to you, God is light. God is light. And there's absolutely no darkness in him. And so John brings this imagery of light and darkness to our attention. And he declares to us that, that God is light. There's no darkness darkness in him. He is holy. He is pure. He is perfectly holy. He is so holy that we cannot even begin to imagine the purity, the brilliance, the glory, the majesty, the splendor that God is. And in fact, we, we know from Scripture that, that no human in their sinful state is able to enter the presence of God in his purity and his holiness without destroying themselves. And it's why throughout there's always such careful regulations about how we were to approach God. And Jesus broke down the barrier that existed and he made it possible through his righteousness given to us that we could enter God's presence safely, securely, confidently. And so he says God is light. There's no darkness in him. And he's going to tell us that God is going to call us out of our darkness to share in his light and to live in the light. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you don't have to turn there, but this, just listen to this verse. Peter says, you, and he's quoting the Old Testament, he says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one, listen, who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You have been called by God out of the darkness of sin, out of the darkness of evil. You've been called to live in God's light. 
And light is good. It produces life. It produces growth. It produces beauty. And John wanted his fellow believers, and ultimately all to whom this letter would be received by, which is the church for all time, as God included it in Scripture. And so he says this in verse 6, If we say... If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. He says if we say, if we claim that we have fellowship, which is shared life, if we have fellowship or shared life with God, but we're walking or living in the darkness of sin constantly. He's not talking about that we sin and we deal with it, we we get convicted, we repent. But he says if we're continually walking in sin, if we're walking in darkness, he says we're lying. We're, 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 we're deceiving. And not just others, and we, we talked about this earlier in the week, we tell more lies to who? Ourself than anyone else. And we lie to ourselves, and we are not practicing or living the truth. And so John says we, we, we shouldn't live like that. That we should live differently. That we should live in the light. God wants you to live in the light. And if you're going to have a fresh start, and you're going to have a strong start, and again, a start that doesn't just last a little while, but that makes an impact the rest of your life. You and I have been called to live in the light. As we think about that, there's a very, very familiar story in the Old Testament that I want to draw our attention to for for a, a key reason, because it's a story in which we not only get the narrative of what happened, but we actually get to hear from the main character what was happening inside of him while it was happening. His name is David, king of Israel, right? Slayer of Goliath, right? Uh, One who God blessed, author of scripture, right? He is a a man described as a man after God's very own heart. He was a man who, especially when he was young, was committed to integrity. He was committed to faithfulness to God. In fact, he had so much integrity that when Saul, who was his predecessor, was hunting him down and desiring to kill him, and David lived on the run for years, when Saul went into a cave one day, to use the bathroom, right? Because they didn't have wah-wahs or rest stops or places you could stop and use the bathroom when you're traveling. He went into the cave and David and his men were in that same cave and all of David's friends were like, this is your moment, David. Kill him, right? Do him, right? Right now, right? And David goes up to him and all of his men are like, yes, he's kill him, right? And he just snips off a little bit of his robe and goes back and they're like, ah, what a bummer, what a letdown, Right? And David said, I I don't have any right to do this, right? This is not how God wants to hand the throne. He's going to give me the throne, but not like this. David was a man of integrity, but there came a day in David's life, just because you start well does not mean you will finish well. Just because you start well does not mean you will finish well. And there came a day in David's life where he chose, first of all, to not be where he was supposed to be. Right, you know, so many times here at camp, we just want you to be where you're supposed to be. Because when you're where you're supposed to be, it's less likely that you will what? Help me out here. Get lost, get in trouble, get hurt. Find yourself doing something you're not supposed to be doing. It's easy in life to do things you're not supposed to do. It's not hard. And David is supposed to be with his men. He's supposed to be leading his armies, but he stayed back in Jerusalem. And one evening or day, he is out on the roof of his palace and he notices a woman bathing. And he decides, I want her. And so he sends his servants. He says, find out who she is and bring her to me. And they say, David, we we actually know who this is. This is. This is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. And David's like, yeah, bring her to me. And they're like, David, I don't think you heard us. The wife, David, she's married. Not a good idea. And he's like, no, 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 it's fine. Bring her to me. And they have relations. And she goes home. And David goes on with his life. And everything went on as it was. He got away with it. You see, you can walk in darkness, but make it look like you're living in the light. And on the outside, no one one saw any difference. Except one day he got a text message. And it was from a number he didn't recognize. He's like, who is this? Who got my number? And it only said two things, two words. I'm pregnant. And immediately he's like, oh no, Bathsheba. 
So of course he's going to come clean, he's going to repent, but no. He decides to do something else. He decides to bring her husband back from the battlefield. He says, I've got a perfect plan. I'll bring him home. He'll spend the night at his house. Right? Then he'll come back later and he'll be sure that the kid is his. Even though people say, sure looks like David. The only problem is, Uriah is such a man of integrity that he says, I'm not going to spend the night with my wife because my men are out on the battlefield and it just feels wrong for me to, to, to be home and enjoy the comforts and blessings of home. I'm not going to do that. And David's like, oh my goodness, this guy's killing me. So the next night, he has Uriah over for dinner and he gets him drunk. Great guy, right? See, sin blinds us. Sin distorts our, 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 even our awareness of reality. And it destroys us. And it causes... Sin isn't just something we do or don't do. Sin is powerful. It's dark. It's evil. And it's distorting David's whole concept of reality. So he gets Uriah drunk and he thinks, surely, now that Uriah is drunk, he'll go home, sleep with his wife, and I'll be off the hook. But Uriah, even intoxicated, has more honor than David at this point. A drunk Uriah has more honor than King David. He doesn't go home. And so David says, plan B. He writes a letter with instructions to put Uriah at the very front of the next battle and to have the soldiers around him pull back to assure that he's killed in battle. He signs it, he seals it, and guess who he hands it to? Uriah. He says, Uriah, I need you to deliver this letter to the, uh, to, to, uh, the captain. Uriah's like, sure. And he knows Uriah has so much integrity that he's not going to open it. Because how many of you would have opened the letter? How many of you are like, you know, I'm just going to peek a little bit, like see what David wrote. Might have saved his life. Of course, he does die. And David gets word of it. He waits till the period of mourning is over and he takes Bathsheba to be his wife. And it's all fixed. Everything's fine. Except it wasn't. Listen to what David says in Psalm 32. He says, When I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, and my strength was drained as in the summer's heat. And so David says, and this was David reflecting back years afterwards. And he said, walking in darkness actually wasn't what I thought it would be. It was much worse. Back in 1 John, verse 7. It says, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So here, John says, look, we've been called to live in the light. We've been called to have fellowship with God. He says, if we walk in the darkness... We're, we're lying. We're not, we're not living true to who we are. And listen, when you don't live true to who you are, it will tear you up inside. I've shared a little bit of my testimony, but that was part of my struggle as a teenager. When I was sitting where you were sitting, part of my struggle was I didn't live out my faith. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't walk in the light the way God called me to do. And it tore me up on the inside. He says, but we can do something different. He says, we can walk in the light just as he is himself is in the light. And then he says, we have fellowship with one another. We have shared life with each other. And he says, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. When we walk in the light, God exposes our sin. When we fall short and fail, which we all do, when we walk in the light, we, we are aware of that and we confess our sin. And John's going to get to that in just a couple of verses. But the problem is, it's easy to be dishonest about our sin. And it's easy to lie to ourselves, not just because we're prone to lying, but because sin is deceptive and sin blinds us. And so look at verse 8. John says, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know, David had sinned so deeply and gone to such extreme efforts to conceal his sin. He wasn't just lying to everyone else. He was lying to himself. And self-deception is a bigger problem than we realize. We rationalize. We talk about how rationalizing leads to ruin. And David has, has rationalized so much that he can't see it. 2 Samuel chapter 12, you just maybe jot down the reference, don't turn there, but just listen as I read of what happens afterwards. It says, so the Lord sent Nathan to David 
And when he arrived, he said to him, There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very large flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one small ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised her, and she grew up with him and with his children. So this poor man has this little lamb, and it's the family pet. Right? How many of you have a pet? All right. All right. Well, I've got a mutt at home, and uh, Laura and I were just talking. I, I, I actually remembered today that we did have a dog. Um, sometimes your way, you forget those things. And I love our little mutt, all right? He's, he's a little crazy, but, um, but he's our pet. He's part of the family. Well, this lamb is part of the family, so you can identify with that. And it says, from his meager food she would eat, and from his cup she would drink, which seems, for, I'm a little slightly bit of a germaphobe, so I'm like, oh, I don't know about drinking from the cup, you know. And in his arms she would sleep. So this, I mean, this is a dear pet. She was like a daughter to him. I, think, I was like, that's a little too far. You know, this whole thing today where people think they're pets of their kids, right? Obviously, it was going on even in ancient times. It says, now a traveler had come to the rich man, but the rich man could not bring himself to take care of, to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the travel, traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. And David was infuriated with the man. So David's listening to this story. He's listening to Nathan tell this story about this poor man who's got this precious lamb that's his pet. It's like his own daughter. And this rich man who has plenty of lambs. He's got goats. He's got flocks. But he doesn't want to sacrifice anything. He doesn't want to pay the customary cost of hospitality. And so he takes the poor man's lamb and kills it and cooks it. And David hears this. And how many of you would say, how many of you feel a little bit angry? Right? Anybody? Yeah. You should. Like, how dare you take this poor man's pet and cook it? Right? And David is getting livid. It says he was infuriated with the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. Now, we might say, okay, hang on, David. Right? It was bad, right? He should, but I don't know about the death penalty, David. And David does sort of calm himself down. And then he says, he must pay four lambs for that lamb. But what David doesn't realize, because his sin has blinded him, and he's been walking in the dark so long now that he's gotten accustomed to the dark. You know, you ever been in a dark room and at first you can't see anything, but then your eyes adjust, your pupils dilate, and they allow in the maximum amount of light, and you begin to be able to see your way around. And he's walked in the dark so long that he doesn't realize that the story is about him. Nathan replies to David. This is in 2 Samuel 12. He says, Nathan, Nathan says to David, you are the man. Right? And he wasn't saying it in a good way. Right? He wasn't saying, you're the man, David. He says, you are the man. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. I rescued you from Saul. I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that was not enough, I would have given you even more. Why then have you despised the Lord's command by doing what I consider evil? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife as your own. You murdered him with the Ammonite sword. Now therefore the sword will never leave your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own wife. And this is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on you and from your own family. I will take your wives and give them to another before your very eyes. And he will sleep with them in broad daylight. You acted in secret, but I will do this before all Israel in broad daylight. And David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied to David, And the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. However, because you treated the Lord with such contempt in this matter, the son born to you will die. It really becomes such a sad story in the life of a great man. A decision to go outside of the boundaries that God had established. A decision to do evil. And then compound it. You know, sometimes we do something dumb, right? And then instead of dealing with it, instead of fessing up, instead of owning up, what do we do? We sort of double down on our dumbness, right? Maybe you want to write a book one day called Doubling Down on Dumbness, all right? I'd probably be a bestseller. Right? We, we double down. And David's doubled down and he's made it worse and worse. And now he's incurred far more consequences than he would have if he had just come clean. Right? We have been called not to live in darkness, but to live in the light. And David's life serves as a warning that you can start out well. You can start out faithful. You can have integrity. You can love God. 
But that does not mean you're immune from temptation. That does not mean that you cannot make poor choices. And here's the glorious thing. God forgave David. Right? He forgave him his sin. David genuinely did repent. But there were consequences that lasted the rest of his life. See, we get to choose our choices. But we don't get to choose our consequences. And here's the thing. These stories provide a warning to us that we don't have to go down that same path. That we can walk in the light because Jesus enables us to live in the light. He himself is light. He's called us out of darkness, as Peter reminded us, into his marvelous light. And you can walk in the light. You don't have to walk in the dark. And then you don't have to go through that incredible pain and suffering that sin brings. But when we're in the dark, we often resist coming to the light. Because have you ever been in a dark room and someone suddenly turned on the lights? It's what? It's painful. It's painful. But you don't have to fear the light. 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. God offers you a wonderful promise. If you will come clean, he'll forgive you. Right? God's not waiting to judge you. Your sin was judged on the cross. Jesus bore the judgment of your sin. He bore the wrath of your sin. And so God's not waiting to hammer you. He's waiting to forgive you. He wants you to come out of the dark and into the light so that you can be forgiven. He says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want all of you to walk in the light, not in the dark. Because in the light there's joy, there's life, there's freedom, there's blessing, there's goodness. And you don't have to go down the well-worn road of pain and shame and consequences. So re- real quickly, two, three things. Number one, living in God's light leads us to an awareness of sin. When you walk in the light, you'll realize when you've sinned. Right? We all sin. John says, don't pretend that, that sometimes we fail. We do things we didn't want to do. We say things we didn't want to say. We think things we didn't want to think. We treat people the way we, do. we didn't want to treat them. When we do that, we recognize it. We're aware. Living in the light, secondly, leads us to confession of sin. When I'm aware that I've sinned, I need to confess it. I need to deal with it. Confident that God's going to forgive me. And then living in the light, number three, leads us into fellowship with God and one another. We're able to share life together. right? Because when we're in sin, we hide. David says in Psalm 32, When I kept silent, my bones became brittle. My groaning was all day long. Your day and night your hand was heavy on me, and my strength was drained as in the summer's heat. But this is what he said about what God did. He says, How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is a person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity and in whose spirit is no deceit. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave me of the guilt of my sin. And so I just want to ask you this question this morning. Are you walking in the light? And is it possible that maybe you say, you know what, I, I, I've gotten really good at making it look like I'm walking in the light. My parents think I'm walking in the light. People at my church think I'm walking in the light. Because I, I knew how to do that. But I wasn't walking in the light. And while I was at Chehi, God convicted me of that. But you know what else he did? He forgave me. And you know what else he did, which was blew, my, blew my mind, was that he called me while I was at Chehi to ministry. And I, I remember thinking, God, ah, no, 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 no. I don't like being up in front of people. I'm not worthy. I haven't lived a life that's worthy. But listen, it's not about us. It's not about our worth. When you come into the light, God forgives you. He cleanses you. He gives you a fresh start. And so there's sin that needs to be confessed. If there's a dark area of your life, I want to invite you, bring it to the light. God will forgive you. There may be consequences, but the sooner you deal with them, the, less, the longer you go on, the greater the consequences will be. The sooner you come to the light the better it will be. The freedom you will experience will be incredible. And you'll experience God's joy and blessing, fellowship with Him and with one another. So I want to invite you, run to the light and walk in the light. Let's pray together. Father, you have invited us out of darkness and into your light. But sometimes we choose darkness anyway. Father, I pray that you would expose those areas of darkness, not so that we would feel guilty or bad or shame, but so that we would run to your forgiveness I pray that we would walk in the light. And if there's somebody here this morning that's got an area of darkness that they've been hiding, I pray that you would give them the courage to bring it into your light, to get help if they need, so that they can experience your freedom and forgiveness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.